And then I came out, I think I was 24 seconds oh, behind. Yeah, I've got with, 28 here. Yeah, 28 <laughs> with 24 laps to go or something. Yeah. And we, we hunted him down. And yeah. I was told I was running out of fuel. I was told exactly. to slow down and I was told to keep my position. And my radio never worked. I didn't hear anything. I bet it didn't. <laughs> Hello? Hello? <laughs> Welcome to a very special episode of Kid in a Sweet Shop. Today I get to interview my hero, the legend that is Nigel Mansell. And what better place to do that? Welcome to Monaco. I mean, I just can't believe I'm sitting next to Nigel Mansell. I mean, you've just been such a icon, a legend. I mean, I just, and doing my research, I have got literally half a book <laughs> of all the amazing things you did and won and drove. And I mean, it's never ending. You're very kind. <laughs> you can pay me later. I don't, I don't remember any of it. <laughs> I mean, just first of all, because I want to hear all about it, you, go back to the beginning, you know, when you were a kid. And, oh, wow. And how, can you remember, was it do long ago? Yeah, no, I mean, I can remember when I was about six or seven. And uh, I mean, obviously going back uh, almost, 60, almost 63 years then. And then... Um, I remember being brought back home by a policeman because I was driving a one-wheeled faster cart on the pavements up the road of the main road, as you do then, yeah. and uh, almost got run over by a bus and oh, the no. police constable brought me back home. How and, old? Uh, and you were six? I was six or seven. <laughs> and he told my parents I shouldn't be really doing this on the pavement. <laughs> and um, yeah, some great memories. And I'll never forget that cart because it was the first cart I ever had. And it was one wheel drive. So if I remember correctly, it was great going around right handers. Yeah. Because it, but it drove the wheel on the right hand side. But when you went around um, the other way, yeah. it almost stopped and stalled the engine. <laughs> so, uh, but it was great memories. And was that. that a gift from your dad? My, my father, yeah. my father brought that uh, to play with and that. And, and then, you know, of course, within a few months, I thought, well, I'm, I've got this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a fantastic race car driver. So I, I actually said, look, can we go to our first race? And we took this car to the first race. And I thought, this is it. This is, I'm the bee's knees. And every time I've done one lap, everyone else has done two. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I had a baptism of fire. <laughs> I had, uh, I realized that I wasn't that good. And uh, <laughs> obviously the machinery was very inadequate. And so after, after that, you you had kind of you went into Formula Ford, didn't you? Or was yeah, that, Formula is there Ford a big was fantastic. Jump? There's there's a bit of a big jump. I okay. did I did karting for a number of years. I won yeah. the Midland Championships. I think uh, I think it was about nine or ten times. Yeah, so. won the British Championship and and just raced. We used to race every weekend somewhere up and down the country. I'd right. like to thank my deceased parents for, for the support and fun we had together. Yeah. In the '79, then I was very lucky that um, David Price. Yeah. I'd got the contract for Unipart and um, yes, yes. I was offered one of the Unipart drives and we had a great time with Unipart with Brett Riley and um, mm -hmm. that was sort of semi-successful in 79 and he got me that Colin Chapman uh, watched the race at Silverstone at the British Grand Prix. Yeah this would have been 79. Yeah, yeah and he, he, he saw that I was the latest breaker into the chicane at Woodcut mm -hmm. and Peter Collins who was the team manager there at the time was a friend and he got me a job with Lotus as an engineer, not as a driver, but really? as an engineer. I used to go around you know, manufacturing uh, factories to see if they had the capability to manufacture the parts of the Formula One car. Right. And then I was very cheeky because uh, Mario and Elio had a, uh, an accident, I think it was at Long Beach, where yes. they're both injured. Yes. And I, I saw Mr. Chapman the next day and I said, I'm terribly sorry, Colin. Um, yeah. What happened the weekend? You know, you must be very disappointed. I said, but you Can know I... what the problem was? Oh. And he looked at me because I didn't really know him very well. And he oh. said, well, what's that? He didn't even know my name. And he said, what was that then? I said, I wasn't driving for you, sir. Oh. And 
he didn't say a word. He turned on his heels and walked straight oh. out. And I thought, uh -oh, oh well, I'm that's blown it, it now. Oh, out the door. <laughs> so I ran to Peter Collins and told him what I did. And he just shook his head and said, <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> anyway, later I that day, um, Colin went to see the team manager and said, who's that young whippersnapper yeah. Yeah. who basically made that comment to him? Yeah. And um, fortunately, he gave me a test, which was at Silverstone. And so I'll never forget it. The, he put you in the car until the day that. I die. And, and because I, I remember the engineer is Nigel Stroud, who was James Hunt engineer when he won the championship. Yes. And he gave me this letter all the way to Silverstone. That what a waste of time going testing with you until you actually basically get to a certain lap time. We can't even test the car and everything else. And, right. I've never driven a Formula One car properly, so oh my goodness. you know we went there and um, anyway I, I did four laps in the car, a new set of boots, new set of tyres, and I said, look, every lap give me my lap time because yeah. you know I wanted I want to, to know and gauge where yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have a lap time, didn't have a lap time. Anyway, on the fourth lap, I went flat round stove, flat round club, flat as I could through woodcut, yeah. flat round cops, and then I couldn't physically breathe because it was a ground effect day, so with the skirts on the cars, yes. so you couldn't breathe around the corners. And I was hyperventilating in the car and thought I was going to die. And that last lap I did was the quickest lap I could do in my life. And I thought, if that's not quick enough to yeah, please him or whatever, yeah. then there's no point, I'll go home. Yeah. So I came in the pit slowly and no one walked to the car and there was no time on the board and everything else. And I think the track record at the time was a 1.14.6. Yeah. And um, anyway, I was panting in the car. And the slow down lap, I have to say, I remember it vividly. I think I did a four minute slow down lap because I didn't want to see them them yeah. see me panting in the car because yeah. I was panting yeah, in the getting car. Your breath back. So he came over to the car and I had my visor up and I was mad with him because no time, no nothing. Yeah. And he bends down to the car and he says to me, he says, um, I suppose you think you're effing clever, do you? Uh oh. I didn't know what to say. I wanted to hit him. Yeah, oh god. And um, and then I looked at the board and I put my time up. I just broke the track record. I did a one twelve four. <laughs> And By two seconds. I'm on my way, yeah. <gasps> on my way. And then they validated it with their regular driver a few weeks later. And then they took Elio to Brands Hatch and did a test there. And then they took me there a week later. And I beat Elio's time by half a second round Brands. And uh, then Colin just signed me. And uh, basically, we had a wonderful relationship. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about that relationship with Colin because... Well, know, he's like a father. He's yeah. is like a father figure. I mean, you know, we got on incredibly well, which people were very, very jealous of. Mm. And I lived four or five hours away and I used to travel up every day uh, when I was working there. And one day I was one minute late. One minute late. I was late one minute going into his office and he really tore into me is and he? said I'd lose my job if I was ever late for him again. Really? Wow. So then we had another meeting uh, the following week because I was traveling around the country still, you know, looking at various factories and that. And um, I slept overnight in the car, in the car park. You see, outside Just so Heffel, you weren't late. Just so I wasn't late. <laughs> <laughs> and I tried to explain to him I was late because several people died on the motorway in, a, in fog and a crash and yeah. everything else. Yeah. But Colin wasn't no. interested. No. <laughs> so then um, I'm getting ready for the meeting, I'm in the car, I'm sort of waking up and Colin drives and parks you know, a few cars away from me and sees me getting out of the car and you know, obviously I obviously look a bit tired and he said, you just arrived? I said, no, no, I didn't arrive. I, I, I said, I came last night. He said, well, where did you stay? I said, I, I slept in the car. <laughs> And he looked at me, he said, well, why didn't you, you know, stay in a bed and breakfast or yeah. something? I said, I can't afford it. So I said, I'm not complaining. I said, but, you know, the, the car is fine. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm not late. That respect he must have got <laughs> for, for you. I mean, just yeah, incredible. He, 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 he was fantastic. There, there were several things that, that Colin did, did for me. The first year I drove him as a full driver. Mm -hmm. Um, it was at Monaco actually here and I qualified I think third or something fantastic mm -hmm. and obviously I was quicker than, than Elio and he looked at me after qualifying he said Nigel why are you not happy and, and I said oh, I am really happy he said but you're not he said well, what's going on and I said well I, I'm not complaining I said but I'd, I'd be much happy if Roseanne was with me my wife yeah. and, and I had a bit of support and he said well why isn't she with you and I said well I don't want to answer the question. He said, well, no, I'm asking you, why isn't she with you? I said, well, she's working to support me doing my job because I can't afford it. Oh my because goodness. my salary was, I'll never forget it, my salary was $25,000 in 1980. 
and I had to pay all my own hotels and flights and everything else, and it wow. wasn't enough to cover it. No. So Razan was subsidising my job, and he looks at me, and anyway, he doubled my salary overnight, so then Did Razan he? could actually leave work and actually come and oh, support me at some races. Yeah. And then the other thing he did, which was amazing, was it was in, oh God, what year was it? It was a year later or so, we were at Silverstone with the 88 debacle, the twin chassis car. Yeah. And the car got banned overnight for the British Grand Prix. They had, Why? They had an 86 car ready for Elio to drive, but they had to try and change the chassis for me overnight to make an 88 into an 86, which was impossible. Yeah. So I never qualified. And um, it's the only, uh, Grand Prix I didn't qualify at and I was devastated yeah, and um, so anyway Colin knew that we were having difficulty where we were living because we were in rented accommodation which was literally um, 20 foot from the main street yeah. semi-detached house very small mm -hmm. and I was a Formula One driver and people used to knock the door at 11 and 12 o'clock wanting an autograph when I'm sleeping oh, for God's sake. Yeah, and, and so it's very need. difficult to live a life and be a Formula One driver yeah. but we couldn't afford to move yeah. because the mortgage companies and the banks wouldn't lend me enough money to, to borrow to, to buy a house. Yeah. So, um, and he knew all this through Peter Collins and he said, he said, Nigel, I can never make up what's happened to you this weekend, I'm really sorry. He said, but I understand you're 70,000 pounds short of a mortgage to mm -hmm. go and get your own home. Yeah. And I said, oh, I'm a bit embarrassed, but yeah, that's right. He said, look, he said, I know it won't make up for it. Get emotional now. He gave me seventy thousand pounds. You joking? Straight away, uh, he's just like a dad, and uh, he afforded us to get our own home, which we went into the country. We went by Stratford on Avon, and uh, we started a new life completely. Yeah. So you but just he... Colin means everything to me. Colin and Hazel yeah. and Clive. With it, without them, I'd never would have gone into Formula One and never been successful in any way, shape, or form. So um, I thank them all these years later again. Yeah. And so how devastating was it because you oh. were four years at Lotus and, and he passed away on the second year? It was year. incredible. We shared a love for flying as well. And um, I, was, um, I was flying a, a Cessna at the time. And mm -hmm. I was in Bournemouth and I was just about to start the engines up to, um, to go back to um, Exeter, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And the tower caught me and said, terribly sorry, Nigel, have you heard the news? Oh, which is yeah. on the RT. And I said, what? And he said, well, will you come and see us in the control tower? I don't want to speak over the radio. And then they told me in the tower that he just died. Oh, God. And, um, you know, it's like your heart stops. And, and of course, obviously, then there was the uh, transition that uh, various people tried to be like Colin and it was never going to happen. Um, and then we had a difficult uh, year or so. And then, fortunately, I got picked up with uh, Frank Williams and Patrick Head with the Williams yeah. team. And yeah. Then we went um, onwards and upwards again. Onwards and upwards, yeah. yeah, because that time at Lotus, obviously after after Colin yeah, passed, it, it, did, it, it got... It was the most amazing thing, Jodie, because Colin and I had such a fantastic relationship yeah. that within one year, he signed me a five-year contract. Yeah. It's unheard of. Yeah. He signed me for the next five years and then prematurely died. Mm. And then the person that came on board then just ripped up the car. Oh, for God's sake. And, and I wasn't very wise at the time. I should yeah. have got lawyers involved and all the rest of it, but yeah. I didn't. And I was so devastated at the loss of Colin. Probably wouldn't but, want um, to have stayed. No, but we, we, had a, we had a great race at Zandvoort. I came third on the podium. Yeah. And, um, and then um, I had a good race at Dijon. I came third there. And it, it, was, it was tough times because my mother died as well on the... She died on the Wednesday and I went to Dijon on the Thursday. Oh, and I said to my wife, Roseanne, I said, right, don't tell anyone my mum's died. I'm not going to talk to anyone or tell anybody. Just and I had a down. very quiet weekend because the last thing you want is people to have Coming condolences and say, I'm and so say sorry, anything. I'm so sorry, yeah. So I just focused on the track and doing the race. And mm. I, I remember it vividly because the trophy and the garland that I won that weekend was on the coffin Monday morning because I drove the hearse then to the crematorium mm. and um, yeah so th those early years were, were incredibly really, tough really yeah. tough yeah and so what a what a relief I suppose and I saw this lovely interview that Frank Williams did that he just grabbed you and he saw this superstar and did he have that similar kind of 
role as Colin, maybe not so Yeah, so it, 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 totally different. I mean, he, he was very tough, um, you know, very astute his businessman and um, totally did things totally different to okay. what, what Colin did. Yeah. Um, obviously, I joined Keki Rosberg, which was marvellous. Colin um, Keki is ex-world champion and having him as a teammate was awesome. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Learned a lot from Keki, actually. Yeah. Patrick Head was fantastic, mm. and very robust chap, and mm. a fantastic engineer and very, very clever man. So we had some really fun times, had some success, and then of course, you know, poor old uh, Frank had that devastating accident exactly. then in, in Ricard, and of course, um, but it shows the depth of the team, <coughs> because although we had all that adversity, mm -hmm. <coughs> Nelson and I, had great success with the team. Yeah. Sheridan Thin, who was the commercial director at the time, you know, supported and guided the team, as did Patrick. But the team pulled together, yeah. and um, we had we had some great times. Yeah, yeah, it's a very kind of family-based team, isn't yeah. it? It's very. Um, so, after I suppose so many years at Lotus, you hadn't won a race yet. How good was it when you joined Williams and you got your first win at Brands Hatch? How yeah, amazing was I, that? I think what people don't realise is that in years gone by, the reliability of a Formula One car isn't anything like it is today. Yeah. And so if you were signed on as a number two driver, the number one driver had probably 30% more chance of finishing a race than the number two driver. Right. So it was very important to get in a good team where the cars were as similar as they could be. Mm -hmm. uh, because the disparity between you know, gearboxes, engines, mechanics, engineers uh, was something significant yeah. years ago. But um, yeah, to have that opportunity and start having success and then that first race win we had in 85 at Brands Hatch was sensational. Yeah. Um, Keki I and I were smiling. Your, your because, image, both well, hands out. The, the incredible so thing, awesome. we, we had 1,500 horsepower qualifying, so we were getting wheel spinning seventh, sixth or seventh gear down this the straight at 175 miles an hour, and the cars were dancing down the straight like this, and we couldn't put the power down. No. And um, anyway, we, um, Patrick devised an anti-squat squat, um, rear suspension mm. two weeks before uh, Brands, and we went testing there the week before. Mm. And uh, all of a sudden, we picked up a second a lap, right. just because we could put the power down a little bit better. So we knew we could be competitive at the front. Mm -hmm. And then to get the first win, and then bounce back a couple of weeks later and win South Africa yeah. in Karl Army, and, and then onwards and upwards. It was fantastic. And they had this wonderful, wonderful, was it the last, and they, the, the, they call it the closest finished. And it was you and Senna, I believe, at, um, just Spain, going. Yeah. It's for, yeah. Oh my goodness, yeah. that yeah. was. And they moved the finish line, you know, they moved the finish line about, yeah. what was it, 50 metres or so, or 100 metres. Yeah. closer to the corner from qualifying so That's I actually thought I'd won the race how odd well they that. shouldn't be able to do it because no. in, in the rules nothing should change from qualifying exactly. to, but they move the the finish uh, a bit earlier and of course there was like at, at where the finish line should have been yeah um, you would have you would have I, been I would in have the won. lead, and, and then just but then I didn't. So there you it's go. It's frustrating, but it was just. <laughs> but that, it was good. That yeah. last lap was just yeah. pure genius and absolute bravery, and then and then I'm, I, if this is right, you then went on to Paul Ricard, and you had one of the highest speed F1 crashes of all time. Yeah, it wasn't good, was it? No, 200 <laughs> miles an hour. It was, yeah, in excess of 200. I remember, actually, I can remember it vividly. I was going down the mile long straight and um, had a rear tyre blowout and it turned me sideways and put me straight Whoa. in the barriers left. And I remember seeing the suspension break and the wheel come up and hit me in the head. Oh, God. And I remember the wheel hitting me in the head and obviously my lights went out. Yeah. And I thought, mm, this is not good. Yeah. And then... The funny part about it was um, I woke up halfway to hospital, yeah. but I woke up on the foot of the helicopter because they used to have, have the gurneys on, oh, the, on, on, the, on the on the foot of the helicopter outside. outside. So I woke up lying, looking the clouds, <laughs> thinking I've, I've really done it this time. I'm, I'm dead. Down. I'm dead, and I'm flying through the clouds, and I'm going. 
I don't like this. This is very windy. It's very noisy. I don't like this at all. And anyway, fortunately, I passed out again, and oh I never God. woke up till a day or so oh later. Oh my God! But I thought that's I brilliant. Thought, yeah, I thought bloody hell, I've done it this time. That is absolutely brilliant. <laughs> and then the funny thing was, I had to do a test in London with Sid Watkins, who sadly passed, but to yeah. demonstrate I didn't have a brain injury to drive again. But I was yeah. so badly concussed. Yeah. But I blagged the test in uh, where we tested in so London. Naughty. And Keki was the one. He said, the way I drove at Silverstone, yeah. he said I was unconscious all the time. He said, he spoke to me several times, never answered him. I didn't no. know what was going on. But in those days, if you didn't drive your car, someone else stepped in. So I wasn't going to let someone step in my car. I'm so glad so, you didn't so. have a little bang your head again. <laughs> I mean, God, oh, I wouldn't have even thought. That is funny. Oh, you're Absolutely nutcase. Okay, 86 season. Let's go into that. So this was it's quite a tricky one, wasn't it? it was yeah. A, yeah. You know, you had obviously the PK, you had Prost, you know, it went down all the way to the wire, didn't it, the season? Yeah, I, I, never, get, I never got the email or the memo. They didn't have emails then. But yeah. I never understood because I had four world champions, which were my teammates, and I was yeah. always number two to them, obviously. Yeah. And I never understood when you beat a world champion or the number two beats the number one, mm. they're never your best friend, are they? No, of course you're always They're competitors. always quite horrible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it came down to the wire and then that tyre exploding in Australia yeah, in Adelaide, and losing yeah. the championship by one point was, was pretty devastating. So frustrating. Yeah. yeah. And that was lost it to Prost, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. But then you came back to the UK and got BBC Sports Personality yeah, no, of the Year. Great. Yeah, people's champion. Yeah, super. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. All the fans and the, you know, the, the public are just... Awesome. Just absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. God, well, I was one. Still, yeah. still am. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so then we move on to 87 season, um, where you did, gosh, there's quite a cool, cool thing. So, I mean, you got six wins that season, didn't you? And... Um, there was a battle, amazing battle at Silverstone against yeah, PK. That was funny. Yeah. Was it funny? It was genius <laughs> no, driving. It, it wasn't. I reckon, I reckon Nelson must have managed to pry off one of my wheel weights or something on the car because within a couple of laps, I couldn't see the track. He'd gone. The vibration was so bad on the front of the car. The car mm. was dancing across the circuit. And so I had to make a pit stop to get, obviously, new boots, um, yeah, some new tyres and wheels. And then I came out, I think I was 24 seconds oh, behind. Yeah, I've got with, 28 here. Yeah, 28 <laughs> with 24 laps to go or something. Yeah. And we, we hunted him down. And yeah. I was told I was running out of fuel. I was told exactly. to slow down. And I was told to keep my position. And my radio never worked. I didn't hear anything. I bet it didn't. <laughs> Hello? Hello? <laughs> I can't so, hear you. So we had a fantastic win. and. You know, Nelson was very happy, pleased for me. Not, <laughs> but um, anyway, yeah, it I, was good. I mean, and then um, where were, and I think that was at Silverstone where you, where the record that, by catching up to him, the lap record fell yeah. 13 times. I, I smashed the lap record 13 times, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just. Yeah, it was mind boggling. Oh, yeah. Speechless. Yeah. I mean, that is I was just, on a mission. You were, yeah, seriously on a mission. Yeah. And is, isn't it when you got the course, course invasion, didn't all the... Oh, was I that know, the one where the know. fans ran on? The public are just incredible. Incredible. Yeah, brilliant. Oh, gee, unbelievable. And I've, I, watched the, I watched the footage the other day and it was just... Oh, I don't have words, really. And then, of course, we went on to... We went on to... You had another nasty crash. Yeah, 87 in Japan qualifying. Yeah. I lost the back end at yeah. about 170 miles an hour. And, <sighs> and then it, the thing which was so difficult is we didn't have proper seats in the car then. Yeah, yeah. Um, because there wasn't much room. And I went into the barriers and it, it put me about 12, 14 foot in the air. Yeah, and then, so you went. Then, then you have luck or you don't have luck. When I came down, I came down half across the curb and my, my bottom was on the back on the bottom of the car by that much yeah. and the curb hit me straight up the spine yeah. and i had eight i pulled 85g up the spine 85 and G it crushed my spine. lower back and um i couldn't breathe and the car I was in so much pain 
And so I was in intensive care. Uh, I was in hospital there for a week in Japan and um, I had internal bleeding as well because oh you pull that God. amount of G, you're lucky to be alive. I mean, honestly. And it wasn't a very pleasant experience because no one could speak um, English, obviously, in a Japanese hospital, not many anyway. Yeah, yeah. And I was in intensive care and the first night I woke up and the guy next to me screamed and then I just watched him die in front of me. Oh, I, no. Oh, this is nice. Oh, God. And then I decided to pass out. I didn't want to see any more. And then the next night, someone else died the other <gasps> side. And then I'm a little bit superstitious. It comes in threes. Yeah, it and comes I thought, in threes. Oh, I'm the next oh, one. Oh, no. Now. <laughs> God, <laughs> next stop one. it. But we... You were right. We, 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 we managed uh, to get out of the hospital. I got yeah. home somehow. I lost the use of my legs for three months. For three months. Um, oh. So when I was at home, I was obviously bedridden for months at home in the Isle of Man. I'll never forget it because I, I was insured for obviously tens of millions of pounds at mm. the time. Mm. And they sent over um, a, sh uh, a specialist from yeah. Lloyd's Underwriters right. to come and examine me in bed and see what yeah. progress I was making, if yeah. anything. Yeah. Anyway, long story short, he said, look, do you mind if I test you? And he put the bed covers in front of my, my head so I couldn't see what he was doing with my legs. Yeah. And um, anyway, he's doing loads of tests. Said, can you feel this? Can you feel that? Yeah. Can you feel the other? Yeah. I said, yep, got it. Yeah, I can feel it. Yep, got it. Anyway. So then he said, well, he said, uh, forgive me. He said, let's cut the bull. Yeah. And he pulled the best covers back. And I got 50 needles all up and down my legs. <gasps> Couldn't feel Couldn't anything. Couldn't feel anything at all. And I was in a bit of a state at that point in time because, you know, I tried to bluff my way out that everything was fine. It wasn't fine. And he mm -hmm. just said to me, he said, look, he said, I'm here to support you, Nigel. He yeah. said, he said, you have the most severe spinal concussion oh, that I've seen in any patient. He said, you've got no feeling at all, have you? I said, no. And you did it, you basically... And until all the swelling and everything goes down, yeah. I never thought I'd walk, walk again, again, alone race again. Mm -hmm. Anyway, three months or so passed and um, I got my feeling back and I was able then to do a bit of exercise and, you know, and I got back to it, but it was a pretty scary time. Really scary. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. And, and with that, you, were, you got some really kind of bad nerve damage as well, which is constant Yeah, my feet have never been the same, yeah. but, you know, it's, um, but they've been broken several times because the cars we drove in those days, yeah. the feet were that close to the front nose and cone. Just madness. So when you hit anything frontal impact, you, your feet get crushed all the time. So, um, yeah, the, the driver's feet now are like this far behind, yeah. which is great. Thank goodness. So, um, you know, obviously due to, due to the injury, um, the 88 season was, you know, a bit... Yeah, in some ways, you know, the 88 season, we should have won a world championship again. We had the best car, probably the best engine package with mm. Honda. And then, as you know, um, Sir Frank decided to because of his own challenges. He sold the engines package mm. yep. to McLaren for 24 million pounds. Yep. And so we then were left with no engine. So we had the aspirated Judd engine. Yeah. And we only finished two races that year <laughs> because the reliability was bad. I got two second places and that was it. Gosh. And I was so disillusioned then. And Ferrari came on board and said, look, come and be our number one driver. And so I joined Ferrari, won the first race, first time out, which was a miracle. and. Uh, Yes. Onwards and upwards again, you know. So uh, and yeah, it's how, exciting. How, how how is that feeling of being the last ever F1 driver that Enzo himself picked? Yeah, to join un the unsurreal, team? really, because when I went to meet Enzo a few times and went out to lunch with him, people say, "What was he really like?" Mm. And, he was just an amazing, amazing man, and mm. we we went to the canteen for obviously a pasta lunch and. Um, there must have been 30 of us, and the noise in the canteen was like, it was amazing, it was so loud. And then I was sitting right opposite him, so he was like two, three feet away from me. And all he did was this, he, he went like this with his hand, and instantaneously that whole canteen stopped. You could hear a what, pin stop drop. Talking? No, Everyone just... stopped talking. In <laughs> case he was about to say something. The respect wow. was just unreal it was eerie just the powerfulness of this this man so um, yeah it was it was wonderful and obviously dedicating my first win to him because then he passed that yeah I that know. winter Gosh. Um, so that was a shame but that first win uh, very special it, you I, get one chance of winning your first race with a new yes. team and it worked and then it took a number of races then to get the reliability in the car to 
Yes, because there was uh, a whole big change with the yeah. automatic gearboxes, yeah. wasn't there? So it always takes a, yeah. a bit of time to... But exciting. Ferrari was fantastic. I mean, you know, I've got to tell you a quick story with Ferrari. I mean, I go there the first time and I don't know who anyone is. And all <laughs> I did was walk through the factory and there was a racing Ducati in the corner, a beautiful red racing Ducati. And all I said, oh, that's a beautiful bike, you know, carried on walking, nothing else at all. One week later, yeah. a racing Ducati arrived at my home in the Isle of Man, <laughs> free of charge, obviously. Oh, wow, this is wonderful. This, this is. is nice. <laughs> so then um, a few weeks later, I was testing there and they wanted me to test the new um, Testarossa they yeah. got. Yeah. Oh, anyway, that. the front suspension was a bit pointy and I said to them, you know, for the punters on the street, it, it may be need to put a bit of understeer in the car because hmm. they can spin it if you have it so mm -hmm. tight. And um, I said, but a beautiful car, you know, great, thank you very much. Thought nothing of it. Two weeks later, a new Testarossa arrived at my home. No, no, it's fantastic. You can, I can get used to this. <laughs> so then I thought, this is brilliant. <laughs> so then we're, we're testing and we're late testing and we're supposed to be going down to Estoril. And, and the, the team or the factory, Mr. Agnelli at the time, mm -hmm. he'd got six Falcon 900s and um, they're worth about 34 million a piece. And anyway, being a jet pilot, they let me fly the jet all the way down to Estoril to Lisbon. Landed it, fantastic. The, the plane was brilliant. I got off the plane and I said to the captain, please tell Mr. Agnelli, this is fantastic. This is fan I'm still waiting for the jet. <laughs> to get There's a too limit. Far, There's too a limit. Far. There's a limit to the generosity. Because <laughs> you got an F40 as well, didn't oh, you? Oh, yeah, we got an F40 as well, yeah. No, Ferrari. Ferrari is a magical team. Yeah. You had your own doctors, you had your yeah. own physios, you had your own chef. Yeah. They wake you up in the morning, they put you to bed. They treat Proper. you like royalty. Oh, it's, uh, team's fantastic. So the difference between kind of Williams and going to Ferrari oh, was just goodness, worlds yeah. apart. Yeah. Um, and tell us about, so your first season would have been a 89? 19? First season, 89. 89. Yeah, Ferrari. Okay, and that was, and then, you know, they did have, you did have reliability problems. Yeah, which was sad really, but we mm. had some incredible races. I mean, the race we had then, at Hungary, uh, where we uh, we won the race and we we're 12th on the uh, starting grid. Mm. We had problems qualifying, because the car had too much understeer, I couldn't get into the corners. Mm -hmm. uh, Maurizio Nardon, my engineer, I mean, hi Maurizio, fantastic engineer, brilliant guy. <laughs> we had so much fun together. We, um, we put some more downforce on the front wings. We made some Mickey Mouse ears out of sheet metal. Mm -hmm. John Barnard didn't like that, but we did it anyway. Mm -hmm. And in the warm up to the race, we were a second and a half quicker than qualifying. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I got the car really where I want it. Yeah. Overtook seven people on the first corner. Wow. And then obviously built up momentum, uh, chasing Ayrton down and then um, getting him uh, boxed in behind the monitor of Stefan Johansson and overtaking him, mm. going on to win the race. It was one of the best wins I ever made. Really? Yeah, it was great. Out of all your wins, you think that's yeah, the, the one best of, one? Yeah, one of them, definitely, yeah. Because yeah. you've certainly got enough of yeah. them. Um, and then, and then, I suppose we'd go on to 90. Yeah, 1990. 90, 90, 90 was an interesting year because, you know, Ferrari are very special. I was supposed to be the outright number one drive for 90, but then, yeah. Alan won the championship uh, yeah, with McLaren with Alan, and, yeah. and then Ferrari being the manufacturer they are, they wanted number one back on the car so they, they brought Alan to the team and said look Nigel we're sorry, we're, we're, he's going to be number one, you've got to be number two and I said well. Did you like Alan anyway? I mean I'm sure um, he's not watching. I, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't, didn't mind him at all but yeah. I, I didn't like the politics that came with the baggage yeah. with Nelson and Alan yeah and I said to Ferrari you can't do that we'll, we'll end up you know fighting one another you got to buy me out my number one contract and that's why I got the 640 here part of buying me out the contract they paid me x millions more plus they gave me the Ferrari 640 as compensation for Alan coming to the team. Really? So then I supported Alan and the team in 1990. That must have been hard. It was it? really hard mm. and, and it was a pivotal thing that came with Silverstone because I had Greg Norman with me at Silverstone mm. with um, Barry Sheen and you know the British Grand Prix is sacrosanct. And I got in my car, but she used to have a qualifying car and a race car, and I got in my car mm. at a British Grand Prix, and it wasn't my car. No, this is a red And, this. and my, my mechanic said, it's your car. I said, no, it's not my car, you've changed my car. And they wouldn't tell me the truth, so I had a 
argy bargy with the team manager. I said, I don't mind. I said, but tell me the truth because I know. Yeah, of course you, know, you do. It's, it's just like a pair of trousers. You know, you know, if it fits you, it fits you. But you can't just change it and think that you can get away with it. So anyway, they had to tell me the truth that I had qualified Alan uh, the week before at Ricard and Alan decided he wanted my qualifying car, so they gave it to him. So you took your car. And uh, anyway, the funny thing about it was, uh, Greg Norman said, you're really, really ticked off, aren't you? He said, you know, well, we said, well, why don't you just pay him off, you think? And I said, well, can I go and hit somebody then? <laughs> he said, no, he said, just go out in his car and get pole position. And yeah, then when exactly. you get pole position, go up to him and ask him in front of people which car he wants for the race. <laughs> so, so I went out and got a pole position. And then I said, which car do you want for the race now? You know, tell me which car can I, where can I drive for the race? Did he look really uh, pissed off? Well, all the, all the team were pretty embarrassed, I have to say. <laughs> but the thing was, of course, because those were the days the number one driver got the best of the best and yeah. number two had to have the whatever was going. Yeah. My car broke down. I mean, I could have won oh. the race, but my car broke down in the race. And if you remember, that's when I announced my retirement I from did. Formula One. I do. Yeah. Got it here. You were just. Yes, just I just had enough. I was disillusioned now. Disheartened. Yeah. Just yeah. going. Well, you're risking your life, and then you're not getting the support. And, yes. You know, the thing that was left for me, because I'd won enough races, I just wanted to win the championship. Yeah. No, I can totally get that. And there was, you know, and obviously Alan spoke, you know, fluent Italian, didn't he? So there was this kind of, it must have been a bit weird. Yeah, in, but in... He, he had a tough time with Ferrari in the end. I mean, he got he fired by Ferrari in the end. Yeah, so did, didn't it he? didn't end up in, um, in yeah. glory for him. But, yeah. but we, we did have some good times and we were good teammates. I mean, yeah, we banged heads together. But, yeah. you know, I just had to accept that. When your teammates are Nelson PK, triple world champion, Alan Prost, triple world champion, mm. Keki Rosberg, Uff. Mario Andretti, I had four world champions. I was teammates, yeah. where I was the number two driver too. So, and Keki Rosberg as well. So, I mean, I had a tough ba baptism of fire, you know. Absolutely. And then when you beat them in the second car, they get they're pissed not your off. best friend, then are yeah, they? They get off. <laughs> they get ticked <laughs> off. So you can't win. Whatever no, you do. No, whatever you do. Oh, dear. Um, and then, okay, so that wonderful era at Ferrari came to an end, and you said, that's it. Yeah, retiring. Retired, happy, yeah. Going to go and play golf, because by the way, scratch golfer almost. Yeah. Fantastic. My dad said he played against you in Barbados, and he said, it's the first time I've really seen someone like so focused <laughs> and so dedicated to mm. that golf ball. Mm. It was like, no wonder everything he touches is yeah. kind of turns was, to gold. We actually won the... Uh, yeah, you did. You won we, it. We, and Dad we, we came won, second. That's right. We, we won the <laughs> event. We played with Robert Sankster, didn't we? Yes. Brian Lara. Yeah, Brian Lara. The, the yeah. cricketer, myself, yeah. and Noel Woolridge. Yes, the, exactly. Uh, yeah, I remember. I do, yeah. Yeah, Bish Dad Noel was said, second to you. Yeah, Bish Noel said um, I should should have been captain of the cricket team or something because he said we'd win every match. Yeah, <laughs> no, you are just like uh, everything you touch. So apologise to your dad for He's me. He's furious. <laughs> it was the first thing you said to me this morning. <laughs> Go and tell that <laughs> Nigel. <laughs> oh. um, okay, right back to it. So retirement. Wanted to play golf, be with the family, but you got a you got a phone call, didn't you? Yeah, they, they said, look, you know, come and drive for us because what happened with Williams is that, you know, um, Alan and uh, Ayrton said they'll drive for Williams and then they came and looked at the car and saw it wasn't ready and, and turned Frank down. So then all of a sudden Williams were out a number one driver. So then Williams offered me a drive and I said, well, OK, but I need all these guarantees because I've, I've been here and done this before, yeah, exactly. unless you give me all these guarantees. And Frank, if you remember, went on television and said, what Nigel's asking for is it's impossible. impossible. Yeah. And then I found out the impossible takes three weeks. Because three weeks later, he got me all the guarantees and everything else. And then Rosanna and I had a real tough decision, you know, whether or not we go back to racing. And I said, well, we've got all the guarantees now. Let's see yeah. if we can get it done. Yeah. So, so you had a three three week retirement. Yeah, as a as a retired driver, I then come back and won uh, Formula One and, and IndyCar. So that's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, can we got to talk about that slightly in more depth? Okay, so when you went back to Williams, which is I did, you went ninety one and ninety two. Yeah. Um, tell me about you know how how those races, those seasons. The, the first season went. It was it was it was truly fantastic, and mm. I think the the winter of ninety one. Yeah. Um, was quite difficult, um, mainly because 91 we lost the championship coming second again yeah, because of reliability problems. 
Yeah. But the last race we did in 91 was in the monsoon in Adelaide. Yeah. I mean, you know, now they wouldn't race, but you know, we were racing in the monsoon, Atten and I going tooth and nail. Yeah. And those cars broke down and smashed in the, in the walls all around the circuit. Yeah. And then I, I aquaplaned and hit the wall at about 165 on the left hand side. And as soon as I hit the wall, my left foot exploded. Ooh. And the, the three end toes uh, totally dislocated and oh. fractured. Oh and my, my God, left I didn't and, know this. And splintered, yeah. And I sat in the car because I was in a lot of pain and it was pouring and they red flagged it immediately. Yeah. And um, I'll never forget Sid Watkins come rushing over and say, Nigel, you okay, Sid. you okay? And he said, why haven't you got out of the car? And I didn't want to tell him my foot smashed because I didn't want to go to the hospital. I wanted to just go home, to back to America. Yeah. And um, anyway, uh, he said, why haven't you got out of the car? I said, I said haven't you seen? I said, it's freaking rain, it's better in here. <laughs> so I just you still there. had and I was sort a of sense crying. of humor. I was sort of crying at the time anyway. <laughs> but I came second still. I know I you did. Second <laughs> still. I smashed the car. Anyway, the amazing thing mm. is the, um, the steward, um, oh my goodness, I remember his name in a minute. He said, the reason I went off is something fell off a car in front yeah. and went under my car oh. and then the car just slipped straight off. That's why we had the accident. Just lifted you up. So then I got back to America hmm. and um, most amazing thing was I go straight into hospital yeah. and they, um, they obviously take all the x-rays and everything else and they say, we've got to operate straight away. Yeah. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, what are you going to do, operate? He said, well, your toes are all smashed and the end one's all splintered. We've got to take yeah. all the fragments out and, and, yeah, and get shave it. Bloodstream. And I said, uh, well, what's the recovery? And they said, three months. Long I said, time. no. I said, no, no. I said, um, that's not going to happen. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, I can't afford that time off. I said, my foot's fine. It's not fine. They wouldn't let me out of the hospital. I bet. And they got security there holding me in hospital because I'm of the- Climbing out the window. Because of the insurance problems there, letting me out <laughs> when I'm injured and all the rest of it. So I had to call my doctor friend, which is George Morris, and explain to him and say, look, I can't afford to have the operation. So long story short, he got me out of the hospital. We'd, I had one pair of shoes I wore all year, which was a boot. And, and basically, to, to this day, I walk on solid carbon fibre. Blinking out because yeah. of that, because yeah, you didn't have Yeah, my foot's still that. smashed, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so I drove the whole year. Fortunately, that's my right foot. Yeah. The left foot was a smashed one. Yeah. But my right foot's not good either. And um, I um, had carbon fibre insert with my three two toes up here. Yeah. And I had a problem getting off the line because I had to put pressure on the foot. But then after getting off the line, I put it to one side. And I drove the whole 92 season with a broken left foot. I have just And no one had that. any idea. And as soon as I won the championship and, and finished my last race in 92, I went straight into hospital. And if you remember when, when I went to the awards, I was on crutches. You were on crutches. And I had yeah. all my foot all sorted out then. And um, it was very funny. You're absolutely it bonkers. It was painful, <laughs> yeah, it really was. Can we go back to, I mean, possibly one of the, and this was the 91 series, possibly one of the most famous images of Red Five, you you just won the race. It was it Silv uh, was it Silverstone? Yeah, yes, it was. You just won the race, and then you came round and you saw Erton on the side, and you picked him yeah, up. Yeah, no, yeah, it's been. But the funny thing was, when I won in '89 in Brazil with Ferrari, yeah, in the warm up, I only did four laps, and the car stopped. Yeah. And the Brazilian fans, Brazilian fans are very enthusiastic, and they're throwing bricks at me and rocks and <laughs> cans of beer and cokes and all sorts of things. Oh and they were really giving me a hard time, and I was waving to them. And <laughs> no one was strong Smacked. enough to quite get it to me. But and anyway, on my slow down lap, I could see that Ayrton was a bit stressed, and the fans were giving him the same. a bit of tar hard time. But they weren't throwing things at him, so I thought oh, I'll pick him up and bring him back to the pits. So yes. he gets in the car and he, he kicks the marshal away because the marshal tried yeah, to put did. him off the car, yeah. remember that? Yeah. And then I had all these lovely feelings in my head going, if I get this up to 200 miles now and go around the next corner quick, I could sling him <laughs> off. <laughs> That's it. But, but I drove very nicely back to the pits with him. But the amazing thing is the car's for sale here I in know. Monaco now. And That's it's an one. iconic moment that you just, you know, you don't think about it, you just do. But what a gentleman I was. I was it, very, very honourable. Yeah. And you, you know, you lost the championships to Senna as well that year. So, um, and then that you had this most incredible race uh, again against 
uh, Ayrton at the Spanish Grand Prix. Yeah. You remember that well, one? I've got to tell you, you, you got good questions here. The Spanish Grand Prix was awesome that year because Ayrton and I are going head to head. Yeah. And they called me, the headlines on the Monday morning was I was the triathlon of the weekend because yeah. someone came up with an idea of having a soccer match between the drivers and the yeah, press. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And the press were giving me a bit of a hard time. So anyway, yeah. I ended up in hospital. I put somebody in hospital, I split their kidneys because they kept fouling me. And I said to this one guy from the press, I said, you do that again. I said, I'll, I'll slam you into that wall, you know, with a good shoulder don't, tackle. Don't mess with Nige. So he went flying <laughs> off, hit the wall. He was peeing blood for two weeks, but anyway. Really? So I got a Terror. second, third degree sprain on the ankle, which is what you don't want going into the race. Mm -hmm. So then we go to driver's briefing. Jean-Marie Barres was up there with all the FAA and the stewards. Yeah. And I walked past Gerhard. Gerhard, being playful as he is, kicks me in the ankle, knowing full well I've hurt my ankle, you see. What a little shit. So bag. anyway, sorry. Being ha it's handy being a karate exponent. Yes, because uh, so, you're a black belt, so aren't you? Like, I gave him a nuka tape, right? Right in the side of the oh, flexes, bang it. like that. He went down on the floor, took some other people down. The stewards are looking, what the what hell is going on? Is because going it happened on? so quick. <laughs> And I walked around and sat on my chair. Gerhard couldn't breathe real well. So anyway, I'm sitting there. So then we have driver's <laughs> briefing. Ayrton gets up and says something and that. So I say, Jean-Marie, Jean-Marie, I, I have a question. And um, I thought about it for a while before I sort of said it. I said, can you please explain to me why there's rules for one person yeah. and then different rules for everybody else? Yeah. And of course, Ayrton realised I was talking about him. Yeah. It was like catching a shark. And he, he stood up and he was blah, 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 and he was shouting across the room at me and I just sat back down and then he was shouting at Jean-Marie. So it was a huge bust up and of course we took that on the track. Yeah. So then we went racing and of course going down the straight we were doing yeah. this with the cars at yeah. 200 miles an hour again. Yeah, and no. one of us had to give way and eventually I managed to beat him and so it was a Bam. fantastic weekend. Fantastic. But I mean the, you can actually see the yeah. anger in your driving. Well, the, the, the press on the Monday morning Nigel Mansell wins Spanish Grand Prix triathlete, boxer, football player, and race car driver. And I, I read the headlines and went, oh, give me a break. Oh, should be <laughs> proud it, of that. But it was a fun weekend. It was great. It was great. Utter <laughs> carnage. <laughs> I love it. Oh, no. oh bless. But there were the Brilliant. days. Mm. OK, let's go on to 92. Um, so you started the year straight five victories. Yeah, brilliant. Back Absolutely to back. Brilliant. Yeah, I was, I was on a mission. I knew. Yeah, this they was it. They wouldn't give me another year on the contract. So mm. it was either 90 to 92 or never. Mm. So uh, you could taste it, you could feel it. And I wanted it really bad. And, yeah. and so we, we were on a mission. And and that five wins back to back wasn't broken until Schumacher. Yeah, until yeah. there was more races and yeah. various things. Yeah. Yeah, that, that must have been quite a, yeah, quite a was, start. When you're on a mission, you don't think about anything yeah. except the mission. Yeah. Um, I know, it, it's, it's, it's survival, and yeah. it's survival of the fittest. Yeah. So it was just magnificent. And then, obviously, we should have had six. I was about we, to say, then we, some, you know, yeah, you came to Monaco here. here. And this is where the regulations are so different now. I mean, mm. Ayrton would have got 10 stop-go penalties with the way he drove. Yeah. Um, because he was swerving all over the place yeah. and blocking me. Yeah, and now you can't pass. do things like that. Yeah. Wasn't there something with the wheel nut? Yeah, no, the wheel nut came undone, and we had to make an unscheduled stop. But um, mm. it was... But what a sportsman, because I could have hit him up the back up umpteen times and I didn't. Yeah. And now, hindsight being 2020, roles reversed, he would have hit me up the back oh, and, he definitely and knocked me would out. Have. And, uh, yeah. So maybe I should have done that to him, but I didn't. I'm, Too I'm, polite. I'm a sportsman. Yeah. <laughs> Apart from you know, yeah. giving a good old right hook. <laughs> and then when you got to the British Grand Prix, you beat Jackie Stewart's record? Yeah, no, surpassing Jackie's 27 That's to 28 amazing. was something very, very special. Yeah. What was funny about that weekend was Sir Sterling Moss. Yeah. Um, because um, when I oh, when I beat his record of wins, he came up to me, he said, thank you, Nige, he says, thank you, Nige. I said, what do you mean, Sterling? What do you mean, thank you? He said, you are now the most successful um, Grand Prix driver of, yeah. of ever yeah. not to be a world champion. Surpassing my record. I said, you rotter. <laughs> I said, you <laughs> rotter. So, of course, when I won the World Championship, 
I saw Sterling in the pit. I said, Sterling, over here. I said, Sterling, <laughs> you can have it back now. <laughs> I said, you're still the most successful because he was bridesmaid four times. I know, can you believe times. it? I know, incredible. Oh, I love Sterling. He's a lovely man. Missing, missing, missing. So, Hungara ring. Yeah. You become world yeah, champion. No, and that was, we had a puncher there and we had to make an unscheduled stop. But yeah, we became world champion on the top podium with Ayrton. And Ayrton was very sweet that day. He put his arm around me and he, yeah. he said a number of things. I mean, one I will share with you, others I won't. <laughs> they're too rude. But he said, he said, now you know why we're such bastards. Yeah. He said, it's the best feeling in the world, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And uh, I mean, uh, you know, it is a wonderful feeling, but uh, yeah, amazing. I mean, what explain? Try and explain that feeling to me. I'd love just, just complete. Um, I mean, when years you, and years of hard graft. When you've dreamt your whole life of achieving something and wanting to be a competitor in Formula One, and then winning races, and then winning enough and finishing enough to compete against the best for the championship, you come second. You come so close within one point. Mm -hmm. Then all the do-gooders are saying, oh, you might as well retire, Nigel, yeah. you'll never get another chance like this. Yeah, yeah. And then you come second again. Yeah. And then right. you come second again. Yeah. And you go on year after year and you think, well, you know, is it ever going to happen? Yeah. But when it does happen, it's um, like a huge relief. Mm. Nothing matters anymore. It's as though no one can take it away from me. I mean, Gerhard Berger said it, you know, when we all gone and finished from racing, the history books will tell Always a story of what you've done mm. and nobody can take that away from you. Mm. And, uh, and I think what we achieved in 92 in the manner that we did it was something very, very special. Winning the championship, I think there's no one on this planet that wouldn't agree that I deserve to win it yeah. one time. Yeah. Um, we came so close. So to achieve it and do it is um, just most amazing thing and and when you think you know with seven and a half billion people or how many billion people on the planet there's only 33 drivers in Formula One who ever won a Formula One World Championship so it's a it's very tiny, small club. Tiny, tiny club it's an incredible club and some are very very um, selfish and, and very greedy because there's multiple world champions and yeah. uh, obviously between Michael and Lewis they've, they've got a, uh, yeah. a full yeah. hand of them and uh, and then you've got Alan and, and Ayrton with three and, and four. and So, yeah, just to be part of that club is very special. So, very special. so, I mean, we all just, as a family, were like... It's a great relief, isn't it? Yeah. Alas, alas. Oh, he's done it. And then, and then I had the most wonderful time because yeah. within 24 hours of winning the championship, I was fired. <laughs> <laughs> That's how to do it. Go out in a blaze of glory. But I mean, can we just say, with that, within that season, I mean, you really spanked it. You you had the most wins in a season until Shuey beat it 10 yeah. years later. Yeah. You had the highest percentage of pole positions. You had the most wins from pole positions. I mean, you were just smashing every single, um, you know, record out there. It was just what a year to end. When you reflect back, I think the way I could describe this to you is, you know, Everyone trains, and I thought I trained ferociously up until that point. Yeah. But with my injury at the end of 91 with my foot, yeah. I had to devise a different training mechanism because I, yeah. I couldn't run on the streets because of my, my foot. So I trained totally, totally different. And the other thing I found out then was obviously 10 pounds of weight was worth 0.1 of a second per lap in a Formula One car. So over race distance, 10 pounds was worth seven or eight seconds over race distance. Right. So I shaved off about 20 pounds of weight uh, for the start of the season. I, I went on a diet, I trained mm. eight hours a day doing different things. And when we came to the weigh-in, mm. um, Ricardo mm. Patrese is a most wonderful teammate and mm. a lovely guy. Yeah, yeah. He Good. maybe get on the scales two, three times because he didn't believe the weight because I weighed in so much lighter than him. Yeah. Because up until that point with Derek Warwick, Derek and I were the heaviest drivers in Formula One yeah. by far. Yeah, yeah. And of course I shaved all this weight off because Prost, Senna, they're um, all tiny, they're all and, tiny yeah. and light yeah, and yeah. sort of 50 pounds lighter than I was. Gosh. So they had a huge advantage just going out the pits. Yeah. So 
the single-mindedness and focus I had in 92 yeah. was unprecedented. Yeah. And you couldn't sustain it more than a year. No. But, um, yeah, and you did we it, were, you just did oh, it. We just, and, and we just blitzed it. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then you got Sports Personality of the Year again. Yeah, no, that was terrific. <laughs> that was incredible. Um, I would love to um, kind of get into a little bit of that, of your kind of, your psychological competitiveness. I mean, you really are. You've got the most incredible drive and, you know, and how important kind of mind games are when you're at that level um, and how important they are and how you kept whilst everything on around you was, you know, was, was seemed to be giving you the big, kept such a cool head. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's not easy at times. I mean, you know, I think I had a number of things that happened through my career. One of them especially was with Keke at Paul Ricard when we were testing, mm. when our dear colleague and friend Elia D'Angelis died. Mm. And Keke and I raced out to the accident and the marshal was sunning himself, he didn't have his fire stuff on and fire extinguisher didn't work, car was on fire upside down with Elio in and oh, God. you know, we couldn't get him out of the car, it was exploding around us and oh, obviously dear. Elio died and 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 that minute when we got back to the pits, our philosophy of life changed forevermore mm. and it was dreadful. It was really dreadful and shortly after that Keke retired and I said to myself, if I was going to stay in the game, I was going to make it pay and I was going to be successful, otherwise yeah. I'm out. Yeah. And then, you know, blow me down, I was Zolder and we were in qualifying and, and Gilles in the Ferrari was here and I was behind Gilles and Joachim Mass was in front and when Gilles touched the back of the, the car, he flew up in the air and yeah. I was this far behind and I saw Gilles fly out the car like Superman and oh, then God. roll across the track in front of me into the catch fencing and his, his head had separated from his uh, neck oh. by about seven inches and he was dead and I went across to the uh, medical unit and um, something happens because Gilles befriended me as a new driver in Formula One and it affected me like there was no tomorrow and I mean I'll never forget because I came from the medical unit to get back into the pits and I was in my racing overall and all the rest of it and they wouldn't let me in because I didn't have my focus pass and the guy who tried to stop me well I don't know, he must have tripped over because he fell on the floor. <laughs> got that, that <laughs> Nige right hook. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it focuses you like there's no tomorrow. So I, yeah. I decided, I had a good chat with myself and, um, you know, you, you realise that it's serious stuff. And yeah. if, if you want to be successful, you better take it serious as well. Yes, and a lot of incredible A lot of people were injured out of the sport. A lot of people yeah. died. Yeah. There wasn't, doing that. there wasn't a weekend that, uh, I'll never forget, we were at Hockenheim and it was in the race and we, it, was, it was in the test, so I don't think we were qualifying and the weather was terrible and Didier Peroni had a terrible smash and broke all his legs and I'll never forget because we were in the next door to a Ferrari and it must have been within half an hour of an accident they were changing the numbers on the car and getting another get driver to get in the car and, yeah. was, and that affected me just witnessing this going. Jeepers, wow, you know, so this, is, this is horrendous. So cold. Yeah, well, it appeared to be. Yeah, and I suppose that that just, what, just after seeing horror after horror, yeah. you just kind of get a bit, you get steely-eyed. I think, I think the thing which, you know, which doesn't happen now, thank goodness, is when we were racing in Canada and I was, I was with Lotus at that time, and you probably remember when, I think it was Patrick Tarnbay stored on the front row on pole position, and and Paletti mm. didn't see him and came into the Straight back of the car back. and the car shortened by two thirds and, mm. and I, was, I was going to see if I could assist or go anything and Colin Chapman got me in a headlock and said, you're Just not seeing this, you're not see you'll never drive again if you see this. Really? And he pulled me off sideways. On the restart, because they said he was alive and they took him off to hospital, but he wasn't, he was dead. Mm. And on the restart, I was following the Alfa Romeo, Bruno Giacomelli and Bruno Giacomelli is best friends with Paletti. I never realised because Bruno was crying in the car. Mm. I was following him, and this is in the race. I don't know. I don't know how many laps had gone, but I was slipstreaming him at about 180, 190 miles an hour, and he just decided that he didn't want to race anymore. So he just lifted off a bit early. I hit him up the back and went in the air, 
and uh, the impact put this hand through the steering wheel and then when I landed that wheel landed first and the steering wheel did that and just broke my arm in three places and uh, I'll never forget that race I was in the same hospital <laughs> oh my and you just God. go oh, I don't believe this you know and then I drove the rest of the year with a broken arm uh, yeah, so I never missed hard, a race I had a, a leather strap with a metal bar at the middle of it just in the palm of the hand twisting. just to give it some support and what was it like because um, in your last year it was when Senna died as well, wasn't it? What, what sh yeah, that dreadful. shook the dreadful. Yeah, world. I, think, I think that finished me off. Yeah. I think like everybody, I thought Ayrton was bulletproof. Mm. Um, it was, um, it shook the world. I mean, Roland Ratzenberger on the Saturday, I can't, was shockingly I can't enough. Even... But the thing is, is, um, oh my goodness me, um, who was it? The day before and testing almost had a yes. monumental accident. Yes. A Brazilian. Who so, was it? Oh my god. Can goodness. you remember the name? I remember it like that. But um, yeah, I mean to have two die that weekend is just uh, unbelievable. Of course, hardest thing I did was they brought me back to drive Ayrton's car, and that was a horrible experience. Um, but then a lot of politics were involved there again, yeah. and uh, yeah, don't want to even remember it. Well, we all send all our love to all you amazing heroes up there. Let's move on to slightly lighter things. Formula One world champion, straight into Indy, first person ever on their debut to win an Indy, eventually <laughs> to win the whole championship. So I mean, also the first it, time to do it that. It sounds easy, but it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> we, we got to the first race and they made me put learner stripes on the back of the car. And so I said, look, I'm the reigning world champion. Do I really have to have learner stripes on? Huh? Yep. <laughs> so I get pole position, which has never been done in the history no, of IndyCar. I know. So then they black fragged me halfway through the race because they didn't want me to win, but I still won. So then I said to them, can I take my learner stripes off now? They said no. <laughs> and of course the second race then, I go and hit the blooming wall backwards at 220 miles an hour at Phoenix. At Phoenix, that was... And the shock wave split my back open and... Uh, oh, gosh, I had, had 148 my. stitches in my lower back. Uh, what? They took a 12 inch by 14 inch section of my back away. The amazing thing is, you can look it up in the uh, medical journals of, uh, of uh, American medicine, yeah. and they called it the Mansell lesion, because they didn't know how to put me back together, because the only same uh, injuries they'd seen was in plane crashes, when the shearing force of the plane hits the ground, the, the um, back tears, uh, the skin and bone tears and separates from one another. And so they didn't know how to repair it because they'd only ever seen this damage with dead people. Oh, nice! So um, I had three surgeons, uh, Terry Trammell, the, the uh, most experienced motorsport specialist and surgeon in America, put me back together with George Morris and uh, Mike Piazza. Wow! And within 10 days with 148 stitches in my back. Oh, please don't was, tell me you're back I in the car. I was pulling 5G, oh, you're qualifying at Indy. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going around, I was going around one of the corners going <laughs> and I could feel them coming undone <laughs> and I thought, Stop it. I don't like this. <laughs> Stop it. So I qualified and then I had a couple of weeks off before the race so but it was <laughs> Thank bloody God. painful. It was, <laughs> oh you are just something no, it else. Was, um, it was quite interesting. And, uh, and, and you got a, an amazing win at Indianapolis. How, came third. Oh, know. was it? Oh, yeah. God. Are you going to fire no, no, the no, researcher that I got was, me that? I was winning with three laps to go, and they put the yellow flag out for oh. St. James. And there was nothing on the track, but they didn't want me to win. And then I got jumped on the restart and came third. Oh, yeah. So, so, okay, I was premature. Never mind. Never mind. Um, I mean, and indeed, just great fun. Tick that box. Yeah, they, they said, yeah. you know, I wouldn't know what to do on oval tracks, and they were probably quite right after my first oval race because yeah. I almost killed myself. Yeah. And um, so you like that. Mario Andretti that. wasn't terribly supportive and showing me the ropes. And AJ Foyt, another legend, said, Well, look, he said, The best advice I can give you, Nigel, don't turn right, you'll eat concrete. Yeah. Rick Mears Is that said, it? Well, it's just like, you know, getting a stone with a piece of string and whizzing it round and whizzing it round and knowing there's two types of drivers the ones that hit the wall and the ones who are going to hit the wall. Yeah. And when the string breaks, you hit the wall. Gosh. How's that going to help me drive yeah, around? No, that, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, so hence why you did, you so, only did one season. Yeah, but I won, I won four 
oval yeah. races or when the super speedway I qualified at 233.75 miles an hour average. Oh, just which doodling, is just doodling along. Doodling along, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Unbelievable. But it's insane. Some of the racing was just totally insane. Yeah, yeah. it really is. Yeah. And so, okay, one year of that, tick the box, um, you know, was successful, got your wins, and then, and then back to F1. Um, and so you rejoined Williams at this time? Yeah, well, we, we should have done. We, we did the yeah. four races. Um, did four, yeah. And we obviously qualified in, on pole and then got out of the way of the championship contenders and just followed them yeah. and watched them knock each other off and then won the race in 94. Uh, yeah. Then my contract was not upheld in 95, in which should have been, which is another long story. And, and in the end, I had enough of all the politics and everything else and mm. decided that was it. That was it. Yeah. Hung up the hat. But, I, but I'm really, really grateful. I mean, you know, to still be alive today and carry some of the injuries I've got. And, Unbelievable. You know, the adversity that we we went through. I mean, I'm way ahead of the, you know, uh, the curveball. Yeah. I'm, I'm very, very happy. And because, you know, you were such a dynamic driver and so, you know, competitive. Yeah, we, 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 I mean, the we lion. Did, your yeah, we, we, the we, lion. Did, we did Fearless. things which was crazy. Two, two, two things which was really embarrassing in America, but so significant, was New Hampshire was my 40th birthday. And, and with three laps to go, I, I overtook poor Tracy with the Penske on the outside of turn one and two, which has never been done in IndyCar history. And dangerous move, obviously, but I went on to win the race and everybody was like, you don't believe this. Mm -hmm. And then Indy that year as well, um, I was in a five car tow doing 250 miles an hour because I was on the rev limiter. Mm -hmm. And then the commentator is saying, well, he's not gonna be able to take anybody. You know, no one overtakes on the outside. It's impossible and mm -hmm. so dangerous, it's a joke. Mm -hmm. And then at that time, I just passed three cars on the outside. And the other commentator said, well, no one's told him he can't do that. <laughs> and so we rewrote the book of overtaking. He did. In Indian oval races, and but I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, you've got to be a bit suicidal, a bit nutty. Yeah, <laughs> because also there's another corner, the Peril Delta, was it? Yeah, that's yeah. Now no, no, that's amazing. I went, oh, jeepers, yeah, that was incredible, wasn't that it? That was now but, my... But, but Gerhard really upset me. I mean, yeah. we're I going bet. down the straight. I was just about to turn in the corner at the end of the straight. And I looked in my mirror quick, not that you can see too much. And I saw four wheels locked up, smoke coming off, yeah, and he's right. going to T-bone me. So the corner goes this way. I actually physically turned the car and moved left out for him to overtake me and go. Yeah. So then I was towing him, going into the power, and I went around the outside of him, 195 miles an hour, and I didn't lift around the outside. And obviously made the car stick without falling off and came second and all the rest of it. And the funny thing about that was that on the slow down lap, Everyone was cheering and clapping me, and I thought, hey, I might have won the race. I mean, yeah, I think Pross has on. broken down. I've won the race because yeah. everyone was, everybody came out the pits. It's the only time everyone's come out the pit, and they were clapping me down the pit lane and everything else. I'm going, I won the race. I won the race. <laughs> what the hell's going on? And, um, and of course, they were so impressed with the overtake maneuver, yeah. maneuver they were giving me all the incredible stuff. But yeah. the, there's an even better story than that that people won't know but I will share with you yeah it was in um, it was in 85 and Keki was my teammate in 85 and the early engines with Honda I mean we came one year to Monaco and I think Keki blew four engines up or five engines up and that we had we had a we had a bit of a tough time but anyway in qualifying I was going through the tunnel mm. eh, in the middle of the tunnel you do at 195 and there was a bump in the middle of the tunnel. Yeah. And then I was qualifying. I hit this bump in the middle of the tunnel, 195. Yeah. The car did a 360. What? And then I came out, and I didn't hit anything. I came out, still doing about 190, and went on and qualified and got pole position the next lap, you see. So I, I, I come into the pits after qualifying and everything else. Keki comes running up to me and says, are you OK, are you OK? He said, I said, what do you mean am I OK? And he said, do you remember? I said, I said, what's your problem? <laughs> he said, I was behind you going into the tunnel. He said, when you spun, I couldn't see anything for the smoke and everything. Then I was ducking in the car for the tires, the gearbox or the engine because yeah. it was going to be a huge yeah, accident. And yeah. um, he said, you're mad. He said, you're totally <laughs> mad. <laughs> 
I so, can't believe uh, it. Keki was wonderful. It was really funny. One. <laughs> D- and no one knew? No one knew except him and me. Because <laughs> there wasn't cameras in there at this time. <laughs> Nige, oh, honestly. Man. Oh, we had a lot of fun. You yeah, are yeah. such a and legend. Then, and then with Ferrari, if you remember, at Imola. Do you remember Imola? Gerhard yeah. pushed me off down yeah. the main straight and I yeah. did a 360 again, about 190. Carried on going and yeah. broke the track record the next time. I, I, honestly, yeah. your control and your it's speed. It's the adrenaline of, level. G- the of adrenaline correcting. level. He knows a lot about adrenaline. Yeah, he does <laughs> over there. Thank you. Perfect timing. I know, thank you. Thank you, sweetheart. Oh, you are just so yeah. incredible. And those stories. Oh. Thank you, darling. You are just one very, very special human being. Oh, so are you. No, you uh, really are. Uh, thank you for all your support over the years. You've been oh magnificent. Oh, my God. I'm just like And thank you, Sotheby's, for doing a great yeah. job. And Hopefully tonight will be special. Yeah. And I uh, also want to thank, because we've got this beautiful boat from Hill Robinson yeah. Yeah. that uh, loaned it up to us for um, to do our interview. So thank Excellent. you very much to those guys as well. And, um, and we'll be there tonight. Tonight. Tonight's the big night. Tonight's the big <laughs> night. We'll get a bottle of champagne ready. Yeah. And it only takes one drink. <laughs> I'm anybody's there. Oh, God. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, my darling. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you for everything. Hope you enjoyed that, guys.